I'm Keith McCullough. Welcome back. Uh, I, I thought, uh, I was thinking maybe, maybe sort of we'd talk to Bianco about the Fed, but I, I, I want to mix it up here. I want to, I want to start about, uh, I want to start talking hockey. Let's talk hockey. Oh, I could talk hockey the whole hour if you want to. <laughs> you guys got something going on in Chicago uh, tonight? Yeah, we've got opening night of the NHL. And for those that are not hockey fans, the, the Blackhawks, uh, drafted Connor Bedard, who is considered a generational talent and potentially the next face of hockey. He's only 17 years old, or he was when they drafted him. He needed his parents to sign his contract because he's not <laughs> old enough. But there's a lot of hope that this is going to be the next you know, big thing when it comes to hockey, this kid. And uh, it starts all tonight when they play the Pittsburgh Penguins. And the last big thing in hockey, Sidney Crosby. Yeah. When he was uh, drafted, what, about 18 years ago or something like that? Yeah, I remember that um, you know, like it was yesterday. He, he just, he's timeless, uh, Sidney Crosby. And, and, of course, Sid is kind of like you and I. Now, now he's kind of like a little surlier in his old age, and he even got in a fight in the preseason backstopping Latang. I don't know if you saw that, but Crosby yeah, just, yeah. He just, uh, he does not get taken any shit anymore. And, and you're not either, one, so we will get into the Fed. I mean, I read this quote by you, man. I mean, you have some of the best one-liners in the league, by the way. Um, and, 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 and also, for those of you that don't know Jim Bianco, he's one of the few strategists that really you know, starts with the bond market, currency market, not just staring at like seven stocks. So uh, you obviously have a seasoned veteran here who's not afraid to, uh, to take somebody into the boards either, by the way. Uh, but you said, <laughs> the Fed has created market economic diabetes, creating a hypoglycemic economy. <laughs> I love that. Can you expand on that? Yes. So 2010 to 2020, was when the Fed shoved interest rates down to zero and quantitatively eased, you know, printing money, as we like to call it, to keep rates at zero. And let's not, you know, let's not exonerate the Bank of Japan or the European Central Bank. They took interest rates negative um, during that period. The problem is that was the unnatural state. That was a period where we just, we referred to it, Muhammad Alarian coined the phrase, the sugar high. So we just kept force feeding the market with sugar. And I'd like to say we gave the markets in the economy diabetes. Hmm. And so now that interest rates are rising, we're taking the sugar away. Everybody seems to be wanting that period back from 2010 to 2020. That was the unnatural period. What you might be seeing now is a return to something that is a little bit more normal, and that's where the hypoglycemic thing comes in. So, uh, you know, I'm doing what a lot of people do in these markets. They try to mix a metaphor with health and markets together at the same time. Well, it's especially uh, relevant in this day and age where everybody's going to take a pill and lose all their weight. You know, it's just like that diabetes is not going to be an issue. No, nothing structural is ever going to be an issue again, including the cycle, Jim. Didn't you hear? We Yes, exactly. You know, so the Fed is looking for uh, financial Ozempic to try and fix this problem. <laughs> and we'll see we'll see whether or not it even exists. But you're right. Everybody wants that simple pill fix to make everything go away. And it gets to a larger issue is which I've been arguing this big rise in interest rates mm -hmm. has Wall Street predicting recession for 18 months. We haven't had one has been predicting terrible things are going to happen. And for the moment, terrible things have not happened. The last decent piece of economic data we got was the last payroll report on uh, Friday at 336,000 jobs. Yeah, you could pick at it um, and say that it was a little overstated. Sure. But it's it's certainly not recessionary um, at this point. And what I've been trying to argue is maybe a lot of that rise in interest rates has been moving off of that sugar high diabetes era following neutral higher so most of the rise in interest rates is only followed neutral higher we're not that restrictive we're restrictive to yep. be clear but people still have some of think the fair value of interest rates is like one or two percent and we're at five and a half so therefore we've got 400 basis points of tightening in this market no maybe the fair value of interest rates is more like four percent now and we're five and a half and we've got some restrictiveness in the market but it's not nearly as painful as everybody thinks and that's why i think that the markets have been 
adjusting to this and the economy has been adjusting to these higher rates and not being crushed by them, which is kind of a fancy way of saying maybe they have to go higher in well, order that, for the, that painful part to set in. And that's not going to get you hired at uh, certain other firms in Chicago uh, today because that's just not, that's like just all not of them. in the cards. <laughs> I mean, I mean b- because you do have a, a class of investors that, that, that quite literally lives and breathes on that sugar high and the expectation of future cowbell. I went through this oh, with Liz Ann Saunders, and you might be two of the few people that'll say, hey, look, dude, you can't get your cowbell back. And that really changes, like if I look at some of our best shorts, like in particular, the XLRE, real estate or REITs, I mean, you have entire segments of the economy that don't do, you know, that, do, that, that will really struggle with that. But then you have all these other people like us, you know, that get a, get a risk-free rate of 5% for being good frugal people that have a savings account. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's exactly right. And just to be clear on this, the economy in, as a whole is not is is being impacted by higher rates, but not to the degree that everybody thinks. You're 100 percent correct. The real estate market and the real estate brokers are on their knees begging for mercy because of higher rates. It's really having a big impact on the housing market. But healthcare, energy, you know, industrials, those types of sectors, it's on the economy side, it's not really having any kind of an impact. On the non-financial side, you could actually argue, and I actually put out a, a tweet thread about this over the weekend, that you might be actually seeing an improvement in a lot of biz, uh, balance sheets because while their cost of debt is going up, their cost of a loan is going up, they've got a lot of cash on their balance sheet. And now they're making 5.5% on that cash. And that cash is offsetting those higher interest payments they have to make to the point where it's actually more than offsetting it, and it's actually that they they might be improving on their financial position. Mm-hmm. So most companies are are not hurt from it. Where it also it does seem to hurt is the general market itself. As you pointed out, investors are now saying, and I'll, I'll, I'll term it this way, the University of Chicago Center for Sec- uh, Study of Security Prices has long put out long-term studies and said, the stock market will return you about 9% a year long term, many, many years. Uh, okay, I can get five and a half without taking any risk by putting it in a money market fund or buying a six month T-bill. That's over half of the gain of the stock market, maybe approaching two thirds of the gain that I would get over a long term over the stock market without any risk. Is that incremental extra one third worth, worth all the risk that I need to take? A lot of people are saying no. And that's why you're seeing massive inflows into money market funds. This is not 2019 when we used to argue, Tina, there is no alternative. There is an alternative. And that alternative is a 5.5% money market fund. And that could be really sapping the market too of a lot of investor flows, which is, as you teased with the, uh, the Magnificent Seven, as you know, the, the Russell 2000 was down on the year. Um, the mid cap index was down in the year. If you take out the magnificent seven stocks of the S&P 500, they were up less than 1% for this year. Why is everything but seven stocks struggling? Because everybody's sitting there looking at a five and a half percent with no risk. And they're saying, you know, call me when uh, there's going to be a better opportunity in the market, because right now I'm just happy taking my five and a half percent and sleeping at night. Well, that's an interesting one. Like, so let's just stay with your, you know, your sugar high. You got people addicted to leverage. You have other people who may not have been who missed out on the whole thing that didn't engage in FOMO, that didn't buy, you know, you know shit coins and crypto up at 68,000 Bitcoin and separating the two. I know for those of you that want to make sure that I separate Bitcoin from shit coins, it's OK. You're still, you still got killed. Um, but, but, you know, like there are a lot of people out there that have built great businesses, that understand balance sheets, and under, that respect their own cash flows in building those businesses, you know, that, that could be part of the cleanse here. And you know, I'd certainly put myself in that camp. I'd love for my four kids to understand the value in their Apple Pay account of, of their birthday money compounding at five plus six percent. Um, I always remind people, like if you have, a, let's just say that you're not big time like the elites on Wall Street and you have a million bucks. You worked your ass off for that million dollars. If you put a million dollars in a 5% account for the next five years, it's going to be $1.274 million. I mean, with no risk. Like, would you do it? Or do you need to buy like whatever basket of the magnificently manipulated seven every single day because everybody else owns that? I don't know. I mean, uh, you- I, how do you think about that? 
Yeah, you know, you're exactly right. There is a large segment of the population of the investor class that did not FOMO, did not buy crypto, did not play the sugar high game. We, you and I might know that as Boca Raton. You know, a lot of the, uh, <laughs> a lot of the retirees down there. Yeah. Um, they're now finally getting what they've wanted for 15 years, right? Yeah. They're getting fixed income that actually the income word is back in fixed income. Because demographically, if you're in your 60s or 70s, you shouldn't be speculating in NVIDIA because, you know, yeah, it might have a 50 or 60 percent correction and it still might be a winner in the long term. But you're not going to be around for the long term. You yeah. want something that's going to be a little bit more sure right now. So, yeah, that crowd is 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 definitely coming back. And I think it's bringing more of a balance back into the markets. Let me answer the question this way. Um, Mike Green, I know you know Mike Green yep. from Simplify very well. Mike Green has a wonderful line that he likes to say, and I'm going to paraphrase it. We asked the stock market to, to, to do too much. We want it to make us rich. The government wants it to pay our taxes through capital gains. We want it to be our morality through ESG. We want it to fund our retirement. Oh, yeah, we also want it to hand, efficiently hand out capital to companies so that the economy grows and with zero DT options and mean stops, we want it to be our entertainment. It cannot be all of those <laughs> things at the same time. For a moment there from 2015 to 2019, it looked like it might be able to be all of those things at the same time, but that's because we were in a bit of a sugar rush. So now that we, now that it, it can be some of those, to be clear, it can be some of those things, but it can't be all of them. So now we're going to have to decide what is the stock market? Is it our form of entertainment? Is it our retirement? Is it a way to make the economy grow through efficiency? Is it our morality through ESG? We have to decide what we want it to be. And we're going to have to make some hard choices. And I think that's part of this transition that we've been in with the markets. Well, how about you know, what um, a lot of people need, um, need to have the Fed make it be? OK, I got into this with Liz Ann as well. I mean, I can make a very simple case that the minute that, that, that Powell declared or Wall Street declared a victory on disinflation at a sub 3% CPI, that that was the beginning of a 40% ramp in oil prices. I mean, that was the beginning of a reflation of a lot of things. Because as soon as you get what you want, which is your old cowbell back, you get a reflation of asset prices. So like, there's a, there's a significant pull and push there, as you well know, Jim, that, that is uniquely, as I call it, old wall. Like they need that. Like you said, entire segments of real estate need that. You want that. You need to sit on that hill and take that cowbell with a cut in interest rates. But then you got everybody else in this other part of America, which is the larger you know, balance of the population that, like you said, if you're sitting there, like my parents are, are retired, they'd much prefer to not be long NVIDIA. They're not long NVIDIA. I mean, you know, wait till NVIDIA guides down for the first time sequentially at some point in the next part of your future. And I don't know what quarter that's gonna be, but it's gonna happen. I agree. I agree. And that that's that's part of this returning to normalcy, because I do think that when you say about what the Fed wants, the Fed wants a wealth effect the Fed, or wants a reverse wealth effect. They want to use, you know, and I might even throw that into my laundry list of we ask the stock market to do too much. The Federal Reserve wants to use it as a policy tool so that when they want to slow the economy down, they want it to go down when they want it to speed up. They want it to go up. It cannot be all these things at the same time. So we've got all of these competing forces that are trying to make the stock market to be do too many things all at once. The Fed is definitely a culprit in there. And I think that this is part of what's got everybody so excited is that even though, you know, you see it on social media all the time, whenever there's such a powerful mean reversion mentality, here's a stock that went down a lot, or here's the stock market that went down a lot. Um, you know, and people then instantly say, well, then it's a buy because it's got to go back up. <laughs> there are people that are actively hoping, hoping the stock market crashes one day because we know what happens when the stock market crashes. You buy the hell out of it and the Fed drops rates, prints money and forces the damn thing higher. So please blow up the stock market so I get another opportunity to buy it at a cheap level. This type of mentality, I think, A, is gone. You're right that the cowbell is gone. And B, if we continue with this kind of mentality, 
the stock market's, you know, when I say it's being too many things for everybody, it's going to wind up being nothing for anyone if we're not careful. Because if we try to force it to be all these things at the same time, we're going to wind up making it just something that is uninvestable and unusable. And that is what my fear, I don't think we're there now, but that's what my fear is as we move forward, trying to figure out what the stock market's supposed to be. Yeah, that's um, a, a, a critical difference in thinking versus a lot of people. Uh, because they have to say what they want and need it to be. That's what they get paid to do, and it's just self-interest. It is what it is. It's a compensation scheme. Uh, but again, compensation scheme number one for my hard-earned capital, I've been busting my ass for a quarter century on this pile, as I like to call it, is that risk-free rate. So the risk-free rate now, without doing anything, and, and yes, I'll, I have a, you know, gonna, like anyone who's got any level of sophistication or a process, God forbid, is going to have that as a piece of their portfolio, and then they're going to take risk. You know, I'm currently long energy stocks, for example. It's been great. Long India, it's been great. You can be long whatever you want, but you don't have to be long everything that everyone else owns, which is seven stocks. So that said, you on your page here in terms of um, just, I was just kind of going through your research, you and I have one number on the page that is the exact same number, 4.50%. 4.50%, okay? You put it on your paper and you say, until we settle into that, that range, nobody really knows what they're talking about, especially if they're only you know, spy monkeys. Um, on my page, the low end of my risk range is 4.50%. So you're saying there's a chance. Like, that's as good as you can get if you're buying stocks only because bond yields go down. I mean, because again, that's the old cowbell. So that, like in context, Jim, you know this, but can you just give people a history lesson on you know, before this recent surge, and levels of yields do matter, rate, you know, the rate of change of it, the pace of it, and certainly the cost of capital matters what, what the capital charge is. But the prior cycle high was four and a quarter percent, 4.25 percent. I can't get to 4.3, I can't get to 4.4, I can barely get to 4.5. And that is, that's the brave new world that, that I think you and I agree is something that people have been, since August 1st, like very poorly prepared for. I agree. I mean, there's an old saying that, uh, you know, the, uh, the Fed will raise rates until something breaks. Uh, OK, that's probably true. And that will eventually over time be true. We thought it was in March when right. we thought for a hot second there that they broke the banks. But then they they created the, you know, the bank term funding facility where the bank said, you know, here, give me all of your bad bonds and I'll give you 100 cents on the dollar as a perpetual loan. And they seem to have fixed it at least for a while um, right now. Uh, but I do think you're right that when something breaks and the Fed starts cutting rates, where are they going with this? Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of people say, well, we're going back to zero and there's going to be quantitative easing and, this, and the S&P will go to 5,500. No, maybe they're going to go back to three for a quick second and then rebound back to four and a half. And there will be no quantitative easing during it. That's what the next rate cut cycle looked like. Now, what does that remind us of? Everything the way the market worked before 2008, mm. uh, before quantitative easing. Interest rates during that period, there's a metric that we like to use called real rates. What that is, is that's the interest rates minus the inflation rate. And a lot of people have been making a big deal that the real rate in the 10 year bond is two and a half percent, meaning that the the interest rate on bonds is about two and a half percent above the inflation rate and that that's the highest since 2009. Again, measuring it from 2010 to 2020, that abnormal period. But over the last 50 years, what has been the average real rate? Two and a half percent. Where are we now? Two and a half percent. We might be very close to being like at a normal rate of interest. And we've got so many people, like you said, either leveraged or demanding lower interest rates or want the competition to the stock market to go away by lowering interest rates that they're acting like they're on their knees saying that these rates are unsustainable. We're going to have a recession. But really, we're just at the 50 year average of what they always were. Yeah. It's just we're so used to that prior period of 2010 to 2020. We forgot that was not normal. This is closer to being normal. And so I think it permeates a lot of the investment decisions and even a lot of business decisions right now. And a lot of people are going to have to understand that this is a different world. And if that four and a half that you mentioned is normal, 
it's not nearly as painful as everybody's going to think. It is painful. It's a little bit pain. Well, it's a little bit painful. It's not. It's not uh, terribly painful. And four and a half, depending on your views on, and I want to get that next. Uh, depending on where inflation sticks, guys, go to slide twenty. Mine's explicit in our nowcast. I mean, to, that would mean that again, you're right that the market should need or want or look for higher rates because if you stick inflation at my number at a at a reacceleration towards three point six percent. You're not using the low June print of sub 3% headline, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, like, it, guys, can I draw on that, by the way, just so Jim, Jim can walk people through this. What he said, uh, what he was trying to tell you was that this was not normal. Like, where, where you came from, where inflation was at 0%, that is not normal. It's also not normal for inflation not to fade in that range. This isn't normal. This isn't normal because now you're still above, called 100 basis points, Jim. You know, kind of going back to 08, where inflation could get two to two and a half percent. I agree. I agree that uh, <clears throat> that prior period of low inflation was not normal, um, and and or even if you want to argue it was, and a lot of economists do, it's over. We've had, <laughs> as I like to say, uh, we've had a big regime shift. The spring of 2020 was arguably one of the most important economic events of our lifetime. We shut down the global economy and we restarted it. We rebooted it. And coming out of that reboot, it's not the same as it was going into it. Now, let me be clear in my wording. It's different. Different does not mean dystopian. It doesn't mean it's worse. It's different. And part of that difference is there are perpetual imbalances in the economy. It used to be known as supply chain, work from home or remote work. Um, is another one deglobalization, using energy as a political weapon like Russia and Saudi Arabia have been doing. Um, all of that will keep the inflation rate higher than we saw in the previous era. What would fix that, by the way, you know, if you, people ask me, well, is there a historical analogy to this? And I said, yeah, 1945, 1946. But there's a big difference. In 1945 and 1946, in September of 45, the payroll report showed 2 million jobs lost. And we celebrated that because we knew that that was people stopped making P-51 fighters and Sherman tanks because we didn't need them anymore. Huh. And we all knew that same day we we're going to have to change the economy to a consumer driven economy. And we had some fits and starts in the late 40s, but that eventually gave way to the boom in the 50s. 2020, something similar to that, but one major difference. You've got people like Jamie Dimon at JP Morgan or Dave Solomon at Goldman Sachs arguing nothing has changed. Get your ass back in the office five days a week, which means six at Goldman Sachs, <laughs> that the supply chain is returning to normal, the inflation rate's going back to 1%, everything will be like it was in 2019 in a year or two. No, it won't. And we need to start thinking about what the post-pandemic economy looks like instead of arguing whether there is one three years later. Um, you know, could you imagine anybody in 1948 arguing, no, we need everybody back on that assembly line making Sherman tanks? No, we were done with that era and mm -hmm. we were moving on to a different era. We need to understand that we're moving on to a different era. And in that process, we're going to have higher inflation. That one to two percent world is over. But it doesn't mean it doesn't mean. 810 Zimbabwe inflation. I'm not talking about anything like that. <laughs> I'm talking about three ish yeah. or so inflation, which yeah. means the fair value on interest rates is four and a half, which means that the stock market has now got perpetual competition for it, which means that uh, business owners are going to have to start viewing interest rates differently as we move forward. And a lot of us are not ready to go there just yet. We still think that that 2019 era is still going to come. It's around the corner and it's going to come back. But first, we're going to have a recession to show that interest rates are too high. Then we'll cut them back to somewhere near zero and we'll be right back in that 10, 2010 to 2020 period. And I don't think we're going to go there. So this is different. And yet it's going to continue to be a struggle as we move forward. Well, there, there, there's another struggle, which is, you know, people understanding anything that like about what you just said. I mean, you, you, you have a, an institutional struggle that we understand. Like, don't at, like don't ask Jamie Dimon for an economic forecast. Ask him about how he wants or David Solomon, for that matter, how he wants the IPO pipeline and his 
future banking business to come off the trough or, or cycle lows. And you know, don't ask me what a broker needs. You know, don't ask me like if you actually. If you, so you have the institutional bias that's based on their compensation. Then you have the institutional or establishment bias of the Fed and their economists. Now. You've been critical, and, and, and I, I wish I was because you're funnier, uh, with Austin Goolsby. So what does, it, what does that type of character, you know, there's a caricature to that, right? You're not, if Austin Goolsby was as good on, and bu as business savvy as Jamie Dimon, you'd have a billion dollars. But he's Austin Goolsby, he's just floating around the establishment, and all of a sudden now he's your latest, you know, talking Fed head. Um, but he doesn't get it, does he? No, he, he does. And he's the you know recently appointed head of the Chicago Fed. Charlie Evans retired. Um, and then they pulled him out of the um, academic department at the University of Chicago, right down the street from the Chicago Fed. And he um, was in a unique position because he came in in mid-December and two weeks later he was a voting member. Um, and and prior to that, he was a, a, an Obama economic advisor. Correct me if I'm wrong. Right. He was, yeah. And he was a talking head, um, you know, on uh, cable news for, for many, many years as well. So he's a very political per, a person. But he's probably the most dovish member of the FOMC. And what he's been basically arguing is we got to go slow. We got to be careful. There's a real chance that 2019 is going to return. Everything's going to go back to the way it was that you know there hasn't been any major changes we got to stop with the rate hikes is what he's he's been arguing all along the line now there's others like him that are starting to think that and i think that the doves he's the the probably the most dovish of them have gotten the upper hand on the fed because the fed is making noise now that they might be done raising rates already or maybe there's one more rate hike but then they're starting to start, talk about this higher for longer argument which means that okay we're we've there's one more rate hike but we're not going to be cutting rates anytime soon seems to be where the market uh, what they're trying to communicate with the market and the reaction in the market has been very interesting since september 20th and that has been that there's been a giant rise in long-term interest rates that we got to 488 on the uh, 10 year note on friday you know we're at about 465 right now with a little bit of flight to quality in there because of uh, what's been happening in the Middle East, but still very, very high rates. Why did that happen? Because the Austin Goolsbees of the world have successfully lobbied their counterparts and said, we got to stop. And ironically, I think it's because they're stopping raising rates that long-term rates are going up. If the Fed is not going to fight inflation, if the Fed is not going to normalize interest rates, if they're going to show that at the drop of a hat, they're going to start cutting rates like it's 2019 all over again, yeah. then I don't want to own your 10-year note. And that's why the 10-year note immediately sells off. That's why TLT tanks to an 11-year low last week, of what it, which is what happened. It's because if the Fed is not in the game of being vigilant on inflation, then, they, then the market will do it. And you hear them. Lori Logan, the Dallas Fed president yesterday, Richard Jefferson, a Fed governor, came out and said, the market is doing the work for us by raising long-term interest rates so we don't have to raise rates. Now, there's two problems with that. Problem one is, well, the market is now lowering interest rates. So does that mean you're going to raise them now? And problem two is, be very careful. The market's going to do your work, and it's going to do your work uh, you know, times seven if you're not careful. Yeah. In 19, in, just a real quick example. In 1990, when the Japanese stock market was overdone and the, the market was imploding and it was killing all the speculators that were over levered in the Japanese stock market in 1990, the Bank of Japan had and the Ministry of Finance have had said, good, the market's doing our work for us by ridding us of unnecessary speculation. I said, be careful of that because 33 years later, it still hasn't made it back to its old high. And you've been for a generation trying to stop the market of ridding itself of all of that speculation. You think that rising rates are going to do the work for the Fed? Be careful, because they're not just going to go to 4.93 and hold there and say, this is going to be enough to slow down the economy and take the demand off of, in of inflation. If you're not careful, they're going to go to seven. Or they're mm -hmm. going to go to seven and a half. I'm not predicting that. I'm saying the markets overshoot. 
And when they overshoot, you have terrible consequences from that. So the Fed's going to have to, you know, figure out what it is that they, they want. You want the market to do your work. You may not like what the market will do. It constantly overshoots in all, both directions at the same time. It will overshoot on the upside. It will overshoot on the downside. That's what markets do, the random walk. Uh, and if you're going to rely on that to be your policy uh, choice, you're going to be uh, twisted into knots. Yeah, that's um, that's putting it politely. I mean, that, that this is... I thought about this a lot. I mean, it, it, it all starts with where where do you start, right? Like, if you start with, I need Austin Goolsby to tell me what's going to happen next, I think that that is your first critical mistake. I mean, you have you know a career political guy who served on the Obama side, now he's on the Fed side, and he's, according to me, on the wrong side. But really, you know, it starts with a premise. Agree with me or disagree. But the premise is that these central bankers at the Federal Reserve have been put on the earth to bend and smooth economic gravity. And I just don't believe that. I mean, I think it's, the, as Brad Pitt would say in a famous movie, it's the gravity that got them. Uh, and it's, that's, that's what's going on here, is that the gravity of the situation, which they do not understand because they don't understand rates of change from particular points in cycle time or the cycle itself and the differences versus prior cycles, because they're just not market people either. You know, they're sitting there and it's almost like the first time in my career, having been critical of the Fed, overly critical of the Fed uh, in 2011, I got the market wrong. Not, not, I was underestimated the power of that sort, Jim. Like Ben Bernanke and Draghi together, I, you know, I just overstayed my welcome on the bear side in 2011. And I learned my lesson. It's like that part of the Fed, you know, if they're going to be doing that, I have to adjust my process. And you know, don't fight the Fed. I like to front run the Fed. But is it a time in our career, the first time? Austin Goolsby is like our age, right? I mean, he's like hugging the line between Boomer and Gen X. Um, and, he, and, and you have a time, I've always believed in American history there'll be a time where the Federal Reserve themselves, the sword turns inward. It's their entire dogma and their ignorance combined and the hubris associated with like, just not even knowing any of it all, all the while. Like, I mean, this is the same Federal Reserve that called inflation transitory. I can't even wait to Google what Goolsby said about that. But again, is it a time where the Federal Reserve becomes the catalyst for the collapse of both the bond and stock market together? Because that's what's been happening since August the 1st. I think that that's, that's very true, that they can be the, the catalyst and they might be the catalyst. And here's how. The Fed uses these phrase that were data dependent. And what does data dependent mean according to the Fed? That means data comes in, we look at the payroll report, we look at CPI, we look at retail sales, industrial production, we look at all the numbers that come in and we say, okay, based on all this, this is what we think the economy is. What is the assumption there? The assumption there is it's 2019. And right. the assumption there is we know how the economy is supposed to respond if this is what the payroll number is, this is what retail sales is, this is what inflation is, we know how the economy is supposed to respond. What they don't need to be is data dependent. They need to have a, an understanding of where the economy is right now. They don't. They don't. They use models. What are models re rely on? What happened in the past? Yep. But what happens when you get to a change in the environment? Past doesn't give you a good feel for where we're going. And that's where... The, the, and this is where they fall apart with markets. Markets are supposed to be forward looking. Markets don't care what happened yesterday. They're trying to figure out what's going to happen tomorrow. Right. But the Fed with their models are basing what they think is going to happen on yesterday. And so, yes, you, to answer your question, Austin Goolsby, he's captain transitory two years ago is what he was like oh, the rest yeah. of them. And, and they are still using those models on data dependency. You see it on Wall Street all the time. You know, and I, I, I one time tweeted out about this, that, you know, Wall Street is all interested in a forensic analysis of airline tickets and used cars and all this other stuff with the CPI report to try and figure out where inflation is going to go. No, what you need is a theory of where it is post pandemic. And when I've got a theory that we're in a friction, that we're in a new cycle of more friction and that we're in a perpetually higher inflationary world of at least three percent, maybe closer to four. Uh, but if you're all you're going to do is is just you know, dissect what airline tickets meant for CPI, which a lot of people on Wall Street actually do, then you're assuming it's 2019 all over again. And this is the mistake they make. The markets, I think, are forward looking and they are trying to tell us that cycles have changed and things have changed. But the Federal Reserve and the rest of them 
relying on models are backward looking. And they're trying to say with data dependency that nothing has changed. It's like it always was. So I could say, here's the payroll report in, in 2016 when it looked like this, this was the outcome. So in 2024, expect the same outcome. Yeah. You're going to get a very different outcome. From this uh, from this economy. Well, th right this now. is th this and is why I was just um, googling him, and you're right. It, it's like he was Captain Transitory. Of course he was. I mean, when inflation, going back to my picture, guys, can you show that picture? This is this is there's getting things wrong on Wall Street, which Jim Bianco and I have, you know, more uh, more checks on that list than probably anybody combined because we put ourselves out there over a long period of time. But you know, when you go when you say that inflation is done going up here and it goes up here, I mean. I don't, I don't know why you would even remotely attempt to listen to somebody um, that, that gave you that forecast. That, that, that makes no sense. You know? So we're going to depend on these people to uh, land the plane or however they talk about landings. It, 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 makes, you know, it makes absolutely no sense whatso whatsoever to me. Um, so you know, I, I, the next question I have on that, Jim, is like, you know, how does that, like, how do you get to the next part of the movie. Powell has to either enjoin with the doves, right? He has to enjoin with this. I'm sure Cash and Carry, he's had more jobs than, you know, than, uh, than, a, than a, I don't know, than he's had more issues in Time Magazine with sustaining a job is probably a better way to do it. Neil Kashkari in Minnesota, and he, he'd love to be head of the Fed. Goolsby maybe too. I mean, the, these, these guys have no process, right? There's, their process, if they do have one, Goolsby would have to be grounded in some bullshit in academia, right? Whereas what you and I do, it's called a Bayesian inference process. We take incoming data, we look at it against the base effects, the base effects matter, now the base effects are very high, you have structural inflation that's hard to knock out, and with every incoming data point, like something like oil going up 40%, you ensure that you have a 3.6% number on inflation. We're not. You and I don't get up in the morning like opining on, on inflation being non-transitory and never having a recession. I mean, this is ridiculous. So at, the, at what point, uh, I guess maybe Neil Howe would say, now that I'll finish my rant, that this is all part of the fourth turning. The fourth turning is here. He is, uh, technically, he's, I think he's 54, so he'd be a boomer. Um, so he would be part of the generation that has to completely both parties, right? Both parties have signed off on this Fed. <laughs> it's not like, you know, you can only pick on uh, Goolsby and Obama. I mean, it's like both parties would, you, they, they have to fuck this up so bad that it can only end one way. Now, that's an environment that I don't know how they don't come back. Powell doesn't go back to them and you know, it's like, please tell me the solution, which is the one they, they already have, which is cut interest rates. Yeah, I think that that's that is that is the fear. I mean, the, one of the reasons why the Fed is going to halt rising rates is that they've bought into this idea that they've gone maybe done too much, uh, and that they, you know they they might have to cut interest rates um, in the in the future. I think though that you're right. This over reliance on <clears throat> these institutions like. The central banks, all the central banks, you know, let's not throw, let's not exclude the <laughs> ECB and the Bank of England and the Bank of Japan, especially the Bank of Japan, probably, that their, their, their dominance in these markets has been very problematic. And if we're not careful, what could very well happen with central banks, if you want to, if you want to appear into the future, let's look at what happened to the Reserve Bank of Australia over the last three years. Now they had what was called yield curve control. That meant that they were pegging their three-year note to 10, ba to 10 basis points, one-tenth of 1%. Why their three-year note? Because in Australia, mortgages are tied to three-year, where here we're tied to the 30-year. Well, they made promises to everybody that they would hold the 10-year note, at, or the three-year note, excuse me, at 10 basis points till 2024. This was in 2021. Then the next thing that happened was the three-year note went to 10 basis points, 11, 12, and then 75 in like a week. <laughs> and then they had to, they had to, you know, the market basically told you, look, you guys, you got the wrong rate. If you're going to hold them at 10 basis points, I'm going to sell every single one I have until it turned into a route. And then the, the um, Reserve Bank of Australia came out uh, and abandoned the policy after they told everybody that they were going to keep it there till 2024. People heard them. People listen to them. 
They took out adjustable rate mortgages. Builders built on loans based on a 10 basis point three-year note. Their housing market was wrecked over that. Fast forward to what's been happening this year. Philip Lowe, the head of the Reserve Bank of Australia, has been on a public apology tour throughout Australia, apologizing to everybody for what happened. The Senate wants to strip the central bank of all of its power. They want him to resign. They can't fire him because he's independent, but they want him to resign. The problem they have is when he testifies before the Australian Senate, they have to remind the senators of the decorum to stop swearing at him, that they're that <laughs> pissed off at him right now. That's what happens when a central bank or an institution gets it wrong. It has yeah. big impacts on everybody. And that's why the criticalness that I have, and probably you have too, look, if if the central bank wants to come out with a little bit of humility that all forecasts are wrong, it's just how they're wrong, and that we're doing our best, fine. But you come out with this certainty, and then you have this dominance over the economy with a certainty you can't deliver, that you're putting everybody at risk. You already have. And we're going to have to see how this plays out. And part of that at risk, I want to back up to something you said earlier, where you talk about being wrong in 2008. I was wrong in 2020. I was when when COVID hit and the Fed was buying a billion dollar trillion dollars of bonds a day. I initially thought, man, this isn't going to work. That maybe this is going to be the time where the Fed cannot magically lift the stock market off of that COVID sell off that we had in the spring of 2020. Well, they did. Yeah, they did lift it off of that. Um, and it took a trillion dollars a day of buying bonds. Yeah, well, in order to do it. You know what the difference? The difference between and you and I can rant with the best of them, at least according right. to me. <laughs> but you know, the difference is that when I get it wrong, or you get it wrong, the American people don't have to suffer from 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 that level of incompetence, right? Right. Right. right? Never mind ongoing chronic incompetence at particularly the wrong point in cycle time where, where, again, you can blow up. The fourth turning would say, you are on the switch, Austin Goolby. You are from central casting. You should be here on that day when that blows up because you just don't get it. I mean, there, there are parts like where I get fired up about it. I obviously just did, and, and so did you. And we could get really fired up, but we're, we're going to have to you know, wrap it up soon. Um, like, I don't right. know if you saw the Dana White. Did you see the Dana White uh, comment that went viral? It was like a 25, 27 second clip that went viral uh, earlier this week. You know, the UFC. No, what did the, he say? I know he's the UFC head, yes. Yeah, like, so he's, uh, let me look it up. Um, okay, here it is. Um, so Dana White, and he has this tweet. Um, two, two of the most hated people on planet Earth, on planet Earth right now are politicians and the media. They're trying to divide us. They're lying to us. I don't care what the media does. They're not as powerful and they're not as influential as they think they are. Now, old wall media, that's like next level. Right? And the way that the CNBC, whoever, you know, puts these Fed, Fed officials up on a pedestal if only because access and commercials drives the business model. I mean, it, if the people actually knew, I forgot whose quote this is, but if they actually knew what you and I knew, You'd have riots in the streets all day, every day, six ways to Sunday, if they, if they understood this situation and how an unelected body like the Federal Reserve, unelected humans that have the ability to be dead wrong and affect all the people, you know, if they understood this situation properly. So let me disagree with you slightly and say they do understand it, but they're tolerating it because what they're getting out of it is for the moment, they still think, like the Mike Green quote, that they can get everything. The market's going to go up and make me rich. It's right. going to give capital gains to the government so that they can uh, continue to fund uh, excess government spending. ESG is, the SEC says that's very important. There's your morality uh, as well. Zero day TA options and CNBC, there's your entertainment. They are still getting all of that. Mm -hmm. So they understand, maybe they understand, but as long as they're continuing to get the cowbell, they're not going to complain. But once that stops and they start to realize that the, the central bank can't do it anymore because of inflation, they can't bring in interest rates back down to zero, and that the stock market is going to have to compete with a 5.5% money market rate, 
And as you pointed out, a lot of people are going to keep a big chunk of their money in five and a half percent. And yeah, they'll buy a little bit of stuff of NVIDIA and they'll buy a little bit of SPY. But this is in 2019 where they keep none of their money in a money market fund and they're told to put all of it in NVIDIA and SPY. And that and what that is going to lead to is a dismay and an anger mm. once the markets stop performing. But for the moment, we still think that they can give us everything that we want. And like I said, I think that they were going to do too that we're asking them to do too much. And and at the center of that is also the central bank that thinks that they could use it as a policy tool, drive right. the market down when we want to slow the economy, speed it up, rise, drive it up when we want to increase the economy. Yeah, it's um, you made that point very clear. And I, I think that, that, you know, again, very few people, if any, have, have characterized it that way. The, what do you want? Like, what is it that you want? And if you keep like ringing Pavlov's bell and people get paid through government spending handouts, you know, Fed money printing, et cetera, that works until it doesn't. And that's Dana White's point. He's like, you, you, we're OK with it for a little while. Now we're figuring you guys out. <laughs> right. Because it's how not you, working. Yeah, because it doesn't working. work. As soon as right. you stop, you know, you've seen this, for example, not today, but uh, in the last, you call it the, it's interesting, the NASDAQ closes up like every Monday for 14 out of 15 weeks and people are saying there's no manipulation inside of the machine. But, you know, you want, you got to show the people that. You got to show that, right? You got to, oh shit, they own 6040? We got to take 100 billion out of this fund and put it into seven stocks on Monday, you know, and, and they do. And that's a thing, mm -hmm. right? I mean, but, as soon as it, like they started losing money, a lot of money, they, and a lot of people lost everything they had. Their suicides is a terrible American story in crypto. It's a global story. Then they start they're losing it in ODTEs and Tesla YOLO call options. They're not losing it today, but they're losing it. You know, they're, the game is playing out the other way, and it and it's the game that the Fed is. I I don't know how you could say that. I don't think you would say, would you, that the Fed has is not is is not responsible for that. No, I think that the Fed is 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 somewhat responsible for that because money printing, I think, in all of that sugar high of the last ten years contributed to this inflation. Yeah. When you talk about you know Tesla, YOLO, and zero GT and stuff, let me put another one on that list, which might be very relevant for the people listening to this, and that's the sixty forty portfolio. The sixty it, the sixty forty portfolio works, and it worked for twenty five years until twenty twenty. This is my opinion, because. We were in a period of low inflation and then eventually manipulated low inflation 2010 to 2020. But if you get into a period of inflation or inflation expectations or an inflation mindset, you know, kind of all the same thing, then stock and bond prices do what they've done somewhat in the last year and a half or so. They move more in line with yeah. each other than against each other. And if that is the case, 60-40 doesn't provide that natural hedge that you think it would. Uh, you, you know, that they, they both go up together, they both go down together. And that's what happens in an inflationary period. That was certainly the case um, last year, and that was certainly the case earlier this year. There's been a bit of a divergence of it in the last few months. But I think that then what I'm saying here is the whole basis of the wealth management business and the you know the 35 or 40 million Americans that use wealth managers that put everybody so many people in some version of a 60 40 have some stocks you know so you participate in the upside but when things get ugly the bond market will rally and it will cushion the downside if that stops working and i think it has uh, and by the way if you go back and look in time it did not work the 60 40 in the 80s or the 70s right. 80s and into the early 90s and it did start working in the late 90s until a couple of years ago but if it stops working I think there's going to be a lot of introspection and a lot of pain and angst for wealth managers and people that that rely on some version of the 60-40 portfolio to provide that natural hedge. Yeah, it's a, it's a real important point. I mean, you, you can keep people happy if you pay them, but once they stop getting paid, you're going you're gonna to start to see the real issues. And uh, you've highlighted plenty there. I, I, I wish we had more time, but uh, I appreciate you're always like again. Uh, Wall Street is not a place where the world is finding honesty these days. But you're a, you're you're a Wall Street veteran, and and you're not afraid to talk about the real issues that real people talk about. And that's why we love having you on. So thanks, man. Thank you. I appreciate. It. He's the only the only Liz Ann Saunders, the only Jim Bianco. Up next, we have William Cohn.